third one that we're doing all right pretty pretty good day hope you've had a good day we've had a good day we've been at future vets kids camp teaching kids about the importance of uh you know training your dog training methods things like that so that's been great today little otis our yeah. little ginger fella is absolutely buggered but he loves it it's a pretty cool initiative they do um they it's like a summer camp every time those kids uh go on school holidays they set up these kids camp for kids that have gotten interested in animals veterinary stuff Good day, Alex. Oh, no. Oh, bless her. I hope she's well. It's been so, it's been too long. Um, I'll just make a start, as always. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the importance of exercise, um, how to use it and how to, how to use it effectively and how to use it ineffectively. Um, we, you know, I, I bang on so much about how exercise isn't everything. Um, in fact, you know, it's, I bang on a lot about how a lot of people get this wrong. Um, but I don't want for a second people to think that it's not important. Um, obviously, it's got its relevance. It's, uh, you know, it releases heaps of endorphins. Uh, it makes the dog feel really good. Um, but today we're going to just talk about, you know, how to how to use it effectively how to and and what the consequences are of getting it wrong and how you might get it wrong as well um and how to get it right um i think it got it ties into what we talked about last week when we were just saying that to try and exercise your dog people often take it to a place where the dog is mentally uh overstimulated and i'm really pedantic with the use of the word over um, for good reason, because I, in my world, the you know the dog training world, the world over, we, we take that very literally. Um, if the dog is overstimulated, um, or over the top, or over anything, then it's gone too far, and it's something that we have to address. Um, if it's below threshold, it's the difference between stimulated and overstimulated. You know, like um, the dog sees a bird. And if he's just staring at it and, you know, moving towards it calmly or whatever, but it's stimulated by the bird, but overstimulated will be losing its shit and start barking and losing its mind over it. You know, what over means where it's something to address. So whenever I say that in this talk, that's what I'm saying. It's literally overstimulated or gone too far and we need to address it. Um, and that's what people do with play. They take it too far. They take, make the dog overstimulated. Um, play is meant to be a conversation, all right? It's a, it's more than just play for dogs. It's a, it's, it's a dialogue between the two individuals, or more than two individuals, if, if that's the case, involved. But like any conversation, it goes wrong when one isn't listening and another just overpowers the the, the one they're conversing with. Um, and so, like all dog trainers, should be a dialogue. When we're, when, when we're exercising our dogs, we want to make sure that they're coherent and we give them a voice. We also want to make sure that that voice is uh, one that we listen to, but we don't end up reinforcing shitty unwanted behaviors as well. So it really is quite intricate. Um, play between dogs it's, and, and us is a series of invites back off, invite back off, invite back off. and, and it goes back and forth and back and forth, and as long as it's, it remains that way, it's super healthy. You know, we get asked that question all the time: How much should I let my dog play for? It depends on if it's enjoying the game. You know, watch its body language. If it, if it's asking for space, let it give space. Uh, split the game up. You know, step in, get them, get them listening again. We're going to focus today more on like when we're playing with the dog. Um, there's loads of ways to do this. You know, the real. I think the three most common ways. <laughs> This is literally just off the top of my head, but you've got ball play, tug of war, and chasey games. Um, and all three of them can be fantastic ways of interacting with your dog, and some, and all three of them can go to shit if you do it wrong. Um, we see it go to shit, all right, is, is how, we, how it goes to shit real fast. It's just when that communication pattern goes away. So ball put, uh, dog puts the ball down, we pick it up, we launch it, dog chases. Dog puts the ball down, we pick it up, we launch it, dog chases. We just become a human catapult that 
the dog is priming the conversation in that it's saying, right, the ball's down, pick it up, throw it, mate. And we want to listen to our dogs, we want to give them a voice, but we also don't want to reward shitty behaviour. And so I don't like seeing that, if I'm honest. I, I, I want the dog to know that it can put the ball down and it will cue a sequence for me to eventually throw it. But what, when it goes wrong, when the dog gets frustrated and we don't throw the ball fast enough for its liking and it starts indicating, hey mate, no, no, really throw the ball. No, no, really throw the ball. Barking at you, nudging the ball, you know, circling you. That stuff, for me, like, again, if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. There's like everything we ever talk about. But when we start to see dogs that we're working with and we've got a breakdown in communication skills and that's kicking in, then that normally replicates in other areas of its life. So we normally then have a pretty consistent across the board communication pattern where dog indicates, person does. And because say it's not a problem, it's not a problem, but in situations where we're trying to teach people how to communicate with their dogs, normally a problem. Um, when it comes to tug of war, people get this so wrong. I think the name, the game, the game's been named wrong. Um, it should be t it should be teaching the dog how to release, um, not tug first. Um, you teach the dog that it's really, 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 really reinforcing to release it when cued. So as soon as you get the dog to chase the toy, call the dog in, get it to put it, say, get really motivated to follow the toy around. But at first, when you first teach them that, as soon as you put teeth on the, as soon as the dog puts teeth on the toy, release it. And it learns, or it's fun to chase, but don't touch it necessarily. And you can pair that with the word drop, and it learns to drop it. And dropping it becomes the most fun part of the game because it gets you to interact with the game again. Um, in chasing games, like if you've got a recall issue, don't play games where you're chasing your dog around. It's dumb. Um, cool, practice games where it's really rewarding for your dog to come to you. The amount of times where we go into houses and they're like, I've got a recall issue, but I really like chasing them in the evenings around my living room table. I'm like, pick one, mate, I don't fucking care. Like, you can either chase your dog around or you can practice him coming to you. But for me, it's like, it's just a no brainer. If you don't want your dog to practice running away from you, you don't play chasing games. Um, so, this stuff, like, those are how it goes wrong in terms of like communication. When it comes to arousal, they, it's the same things, right? We see the dog pick the ball, put the ball down, pick it up and we throw it. And the dog stays in that heightened state of arousal. It, we, we basically just keep becoming a catapult. We're gonna throw it and throw it and throw it. And every time you do, every time you move the tug toy chair fast, every time you make a little darty movement for the chasey game, and every time you throw that ball, whether, like, whether you like it or not, you spike your dog's adrenaline. Um, and it can compound. Uh, we we see people just fire that ball over and over again and very quickly you know you get dogs with a strong herding instinct or dogs that are hating where they are and need an outlet to be able to just focus on one thing because so they don't actually have to concentrate on being for example in the dog park they'll concentrate on the ball um you'll see them really hone in on this and create a compulsive disorder super fast what learn association if not a compulsive disorder turn up play fetch um, they can't do anything but that and, and that's where again it becomes an issue um, can your dog actually listen to you in that moment so when you're playing you really want them thinking more than moving um, the herding dog the, the actual working herding dog um, the dog that dog if you just run around like an idiot he's, he's useless to the farmer you know that dog that actually listens and you go hey mate good boy go around good boy come back you can actually get him to uh, work for the farmer um, if that herding dog starts herding the sheep willy-nilly and the, the farmer himself and telling the farmer where to go the dog's not no good and he won't get worked it will, bad things happen um, so you know the, the exercise alone it, it, physical exercise alone is never enough you've got to entertain the brain you've got to get them to think you've got to make sure that they're actually responding uh, a good way of telling it whether or not they're coherent is making sure that they're responding to your words, not just your movement. Like if you've said stay and you pull your arm back to throw it, the last thing you said to him was stay. So if he breaks that behavior, don't throw the ball. You know, like if you if you go stay, you pull your arm back and you're throwing the ball, you've still, the last thing you've said was stay. And then you can go, good boy, go. And your dog will your dog will try and get away with it, of course he will. It's, it's a no-brainer, he's gonna try and do whatever he can to get that ball. It's our job to set up parameters and uh, 
that they can't fail. So if your dog can't not chase the ball when you throw it, don't throw it. Get them to stay, place the ball down, and then go, okay, well, good boy, go and get it. And you, you actually set him up so that he gets rewarded for listening more than chasing. Uh, tug of war is the same. You know, if you're inviting your dog in to play with you, um, and you want him to not pull on your sleeves and get, learn the more he escalates across the board, like more he escalates, the more chance of reward. We never really want our dogs to learn that. There's, we don't want anybody to learn that. It's just being a little shit. So we just want we want them to learn that they've got a voice, but don't be a dick about it. So like come towards, get involved, well done, thanks for this is brilliant, engage, engage, engage. But as soon as you feel teeth on the toy at first, you go release and he's like, oh, what the hell, what's going on now? And he's gonna wonder how to get you involved in that game again. And you can then start to ask for further behavior. You can go, good boy, thanks for listening. And we'll get him to sit and stay. And you pick the toy up and you've just engaged the toy again. You've just become, you've become part of the game. And what you've done is used interaction as a reward other than food. I think people don't a bit nervous about using play. I think a lot of dog trainers are nervous about using play because the idea of getting your dog stimulated um, is often what we're trying to do the opposite to. But understanding how to do it is so valuable as a trainer and important because you can start to work your dog under, under more pressure. Food is fantastic. We use food for training all the time. Um, if you've ever watched and listened to me talk about dog training, I well, predominantly talk about using food because it keeps the dog motivated but really coherent when in control of the resource. But as soon as you start using interaction and movement as a reinforcer, it's really hard. It's, it's much more of a variable reward. We've got to be so much more conscious of our own movements and the dog's movements. But when you get good at it, it's probably the best relationship you could ever create with your dog. Um, learning how to move with your dog and that interaction side of it is what the it's the real bond for me that, that for me is where you actually really bond with the dog like i love using food for training but my bond with my dog is not created through food it's created through interaction and that bit for me is is the best part you know being able to communicate come sit stay go um and listen to him you know the more you interact with your dog on that level um the more you know him and it's such a cool relationship to have that. Um, set yourself up for success as much as your dog as well. You know, we said if you're gonna, if you can't, if your dog can't chase the ball because you've thrown it, don't throw it. That's not just setting your dog up for success. It's, it's setting you up for success. So when you are um, playing with him, if you're getting overwhelmed because of your dog's movement, don't move as fast. Don't, don't just just keep it gentle. Practice just um, pr practice trying to move your dog around without food. We're just using body language as a cue. Like naturally, it's a simple rule. Going low is an invite. Going over and high will send your dog slightly backwards. And of course, we don't want to use it for intimidation. But it's just natural body language. If you go up, your dog's going to go Whoop, where are you going, and his head's going to rock back and up, and his bum's going to go down. And you can manipulate the movement of the dog through your own movement and actually just learning. I can't dance for shit, but I can move around with a dog for days. It's so much fun. I, I try and relate it to a client. You know, I had one at the weekend where the guy is a rugby player and a uh, wrestler. So he, he could relate to the dogs uh, shifting around and moving through washing the hips based on sidestepping and, you know, throwing people around the bloody ring. Good on you. Um, Whereas the girl was never going to relate to those, but she's a dancer, so she could she could actually move, watch the hips and try and get if it was a dog trainer's point of view, try and get the dog to try and get the client rather to watch the dog, and we're trying to get every time we do get that dog moving, we're spiking the adrenaline, and we want to take it up to a point where they're having fun, but not to a point where they get incoherent. So that's where that dialogue of play comes in. So we invite, pause, ask for a behavior like sit. And what we're really asking there is, are you calm enough? Like, can you hear me? Can you process? Can you complete? If not, I sh probably shouldn't keep introducing more movement stimulus. So I'm just gonna wait and pause. I can reiterate uh, uh, intermittently. And once you get to a point where you, the dog is able to 
comprehend what you've said and acknowledge the behavior, complete the behavior, you can go, fantastic, thank you so much, right, off we go again and we introduce more stimulus. You know, with, uh, with play, the dogs typically do burn out faster. Their like training sessions are normally, when you ask the dog to think and run at the same time, try, you try and think and run at the same time, fucking hard. So they burn out really fast. Um, but it's something you can build their tolerance up to. Um, you know, we, we see some dogs and we'll get people get, tell us that their dog just loves playing, can't stop playing. But when you ask it to think and play at the same time, it's cooked after 30 seconds. You know, you, you go, all right, mate, sit. It might take you, uh, when I say 30 seconds, it's 30 seconds of actually being able to interact. But so much of it is like, you might actually have spent the first three or four minutes just holding a toy and asking the dog to sit down just, but he's never done it. And you get that, you get that once, you might as well just give him the toy and let him have the best day of his life because he's had to work so hard for that short period of time where you've gone, right, here's a toy, but I'm gonna ask you to work for it. And like any, again, like any other form of training, your, your reward has to be pay it what it was worth. If it's super easy, you don't have to pay it too much. If the dog's worked super hard, even if you deem it a simple task, um, it's taken a long time to get there, or he's had to go through, you know, multiple, um, you know, try, trying to trying to problem solve is super difficult. So if your dog is working really hard to figure out what it is you want, you can either, well, you probably might might benefit from changing the parameters, make your parameters easier. What you're asking of him, you might want to slow down to make it easier so he can understand it. But pay it what it was worth. If he's work, if he's worked super hard make that reward really, really, really good. You know, I might I might withhold the toy until he gets it, but once he gets it, I'm gonna make his day. It's gonna be the best time of his life. Um, but yeah, just, I think, when, when you're playing with your dog, it's so important to keep it as a conversation. Training at a high level of arousal, you know, we'd never want the dog over threshold, period. But, if you're training it with the dog under high arousal, it's such a cool way of creating a dog that can communicate at that level. Um, you know, so many times when we're working with an aggro dog, the dog is either super calm around food or fucking explosive around dogs. Play is a nice little like stepping stone to be able to actually create some really cool, desirable behaviors under high arousal. So yeah, use food, but also I think using play with a, with a, a stimulated dog um, is really, really important. Now, I don't necessarily introduce that on in the first session because quite often when we're working with an aggressive dog, they are carrying a shitload of stress. So we might go stress break and then down the track, we'll go, right, okay, now we're gonna teach, now that you've got some foundation skills, like while we're giving them the stress break, we have to give them foundation skills on like, how to use food. But once you've got those foundation skills in place and some nice communication skills between the dog and the owner, using play for a reactive dog is bloody awesome. Um, it's, uh, like I say, it just really can cement in train, um, training methods. It also gives the owner um, confidence to be able to move that dog around and you know, actually interacting. I, I much prefer tug, t tug games like uh, where the dog is coming into me and I manipulate the toy around me and ask him for sits and stays and takes. Uh, I much prefer that to fetch um, because I love the interaction side of it. And I think that those tools can give people uh, a lot of confidence in how to get the dog from A to B. They might not have a treat in their hand, it should have a treat in your hand, but sometimes people get shot caught short so just being able to go okay and just being able to know like instinctively if I, I'm just going to turn and my hips are going to go that way and my shoulders are going to go that way it can go so well um, I think people waste so much time when they're playing with their dog they drive the dog more insane than they do cause pleasure and create so many undesirable behaviours through like compulsive disorders and stuff through just repetition and never communicating with them um, I'm gonna just uh, pause for a second, guys, give you a chance to ask some questions. I just noticed uh, Nake Mondio Ring is in, and dude, I fucking love your work. You're, you're brilliant. I listened to your podcast on uh, Nick Benger, and absolutely loved listening to you. You were, yeah, somebody, I, I mean, I, I've been working with Dogs and Play for some time, but I've seen some of the stuff you do. It's pretty incredible. So if anybody gets a chance to actually jump on and follow Nake, 
dot mondial mondial ring um then do <laughs> he's awesome um yeah any questions guys i'm gonna sit tight for a sec we have one well well i guess i'm gonna stop talking at any point if anybody does ask a question but um we have one today it was a lovely nine month old kelpie uh boxer cross what a, it was such an awesome dog um and she just didn't get the memos with when she was playing. You know, she, she goes up into a state of arousal that super fast and really, really wants it to go well, but ends up being quite antisocial because she's playing, but she's getting overstimulated while pan playing. And she ends up panicking. She ends up uh, turning on the other dog. She ends up getting frustrated if you're, if you're playing with her and barking at you. Um, so the key there was to like pick up on her body language and at what point does she begin to get stimulated? You know, it's a bit of tr it was a bit of trial and error. It's like, what does she give us to tell us when she's overstimulated? And once you've seen it, don't take her there again. Um, keep her keep her under threshold. Um, and yeah, she's gonna she's awesome. She's gonna be such a cool player soon. It's gonna be nice to be able to see that dog interact in a socially appropriate manner uh, with other dogs. Um, no questions coming through today. That's all right. Let's see what's going on there. And somebody requested to join the video. Sorry, I was in the middle of everything, so at the time I didn't accept it. But um, right, might actually just leave it there. Keep it nice and simple. But um, thanks so much for your uh, time today. And uh, yeah, I'll see you. All, I'll see you all next week. I oh, know. Sorry, before I go. Jump on tomorrow onto Leica Pet Foods channel. We're doing an Instagram live there where we're, we've been taking some questions all week and we'll be listening to, uh, sorry, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, why dogs don't eat, what to do with the dog, not food motivated dog, and a little bit about resource guiding as well. So yeah, jump onto that one tomorrow and I will see you all next week if not there.